We're live. Good morning, Bay Area. Good afternoon, East Coast. Good uh, evening in, uh, in, uh, in Paris, in uh, Palestine, in Lebanon, and elsewhere. Sabah al khair, masa al khair, masa al noor. Assalamu alaikum, ahlan wa sahlan. Welcome to uh, our uh, open webinar today, open classroom. Uh, I will start first. My name is Rabab Abdul Hadi. I will start with the land acknowledgement that is uh, that is taken from the website of the of the American Indian Studies Department at San Francisco State University. The campuses of San Francisco State University on the San Francisco Peninsula and North Bay are located within the occupied ter territory of the Ramatush, Ohlone, and the coastal Miwok, who, along with Southern Pomo, are organized as the federated Indians of Greater Rancheria. We use this every single time, not as a cliche, but to emphasize and stretch and reaffirm our commitment to the rights of indigenous people to reclaim their lands, to build their own futures, to exercise the self-determination against settler colonialism, colonialism, and all the powers of xenophobia, racism, uh, and, and all forms of discrimination towards the indivisibility of justice. On the east coast of the land, uh, where I am now, we are also on the lands of the displaced and dispossessed Lenape people. I want to start by giving gratitude and appreciation to everybody who is participating today. First, I want to express gratitude to all the panelists, many of whom are old, while some are new friends and comrades who have responded to our invitation. I also regret that some of our colleagues were unable to uh, respond to this invitation for the October 20th. We had initially planned it for Sunday, but we were unable to do it, which I'll explain later. I want to specifically thank Hassan Mizzin, a friend and a brother who put us in touch with Stephanie and Fabrice Risipoti, both of whom could not join us today. They were able to do it on Sunday. Uh, big, and this is particularly due to San Francisco State attempts to undermine Ahmed studies and dismantle it. We will talk about that later and uh, the, um, our uh, be being busy with the decision that we had scored the big victory last week, which we will talk about that later also. We will be hosting Hassan and screen his film on Fano later on this year. I also want to thank Dr. Jamila Ghaddar and the graduate students who are doing brilliant work and who have been instrumental in making this event happen. Uh, first, Usama Kamil and Lid Ghulum uh, for the beautiful flyer publicity and their thoughts and ideas. Their theses are equally exciting, and you will hear from them in future Ahmed Open Classrooms. Osama will be or co-organizing Open Classrooms on the 20 years since 9-11-2001, entitled Whose Narratives? And uh, we were supposed to be doing it in a class called Lives in Exile, Civil Liberties of Arabs and Muslims post 9-11-2001. However, San Francisco State University, again, canceled the course, so we are unable to do it in the course, so we will be doing it as an open classroom in this space. Uh, Laif will also be uh, giving a, a class on production and reproduction of Arab and Muslim ethnicity and diaspora sensitive, sensitive ethnic studies within and outside graduate studies. I also want to thank Salim Shahade, uh, who was a doctoral candidate at UCLA and the anthropology department, a former Ahmed um, master student at San Francisco State University, who is focusing his studies on Palestinian student activism. Uh, Salim is doing a, a one of a kind thesis, and he is behind, he's behind the scenes today. Maybe you'll see him a little bit on the screen. But Salim has been essential not only in tech and supporting technical, which is a huge and daunting ta task, as you might have heard in the hearings uh, two weeks ago on September 30th. But Salim.
one moment as we fix the technical issues. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, co-moderating the event today, so I'm just going to step in while Dr. Rabab Abdelhadi's connection comes back on. And I want to just add to what you're saying in terms of thanking our co-sponsors for the Teaching Palestine Open Classroom today, uh, especially Connie for Palestine and the People's Forum, uh, with whom there's been uh, quite a relationship between Teaching Palestine and uh, PF, uh, and also especially since Facebook shut down Amit's page, again, due to the intensive campaign by the Israel lobby groups um, on various occasions now. Um, I think we might be getting Dr. Abdul Hadi back, I hope. Thank you everyone for your patience with these technical issues. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'd like to thank everyone uh, who stood by Teaching Palestine, who stood by Ahmed, and the important work that Dr. Abdel Hadi is reading, uh, colleagues, uh, particularly Tomomi Hinakawa, of course, Anusha, and of course, Ahmed studies, uh, as the resistance continued for over a year now against the devastating effects of the McCarthyized like silencing by pro Israel Zionist groups and the collusion of the university itself, San Francisco State University, as the faculty uh, HP ruled last week. Uh, there was a grievance and uh, the case that Dr. Abdel Hadi presented won with, uh, with a great victory. It was a great victory for the struggle against the silencing uh, of the Palestinian narrative and the work, the important work taking place at Ahmed. And I'm just uh, checking in here, Salim, if we perhaps have Dr. Abdul Hadi back with us. Okay. So. Not at the moment, but uh, I can. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to take this moment to introduce also our fellow uh, co moderator, Horia Brutalsha. We're very, very glad to have you with us, Horia. Horia um, um, is there's some comments here from Dr. Abdul Hadi that Horia has been involved for quite a while in some of the work that's been taking place. Uh, and I think you might see her bio in the comments uh, pretty soon. Yeah, perhaps you'd like to just say hello to everyone for a moment. Well, as you all know, this event is part of a series of open classrooms that Teaching Palestine is hosting, Ahmed's hosting. Uh, there's a number of students with us. I'd like to say hello, especially to the students and all the supporters, and of course, all of our audience members. Uh, this is a very important historic occasion to be marking uh, the massacre that took place in the heart of France in Paris in 1961, October 17. Uh, it's a it's a vital uh, moment, uh, and it was also, of course, a historic year for the Algerian resistance for the war of independence in Algeria at that moment. Uh, but it's an occasion that's often been made to be forgotten. So 
uh, the reason that we've come together to hold this open forum, I mean, open class, to commemorate the massacre, uh, to talk about it, uh, you know, through this panel, through this round table, is because it's uh, very significant in terms of understanding not only the history, but the present, the currently what's been happening as well in terms of the nature of France, its continued colonialism, the state violence, the relationship in terms of France and its citizenry, all those deemed uh, Algerian, Muslim, racialized, uh, particularly in the different departments. So our speakers are going to touch base, uh, touch on these different issues. And they're gonna talk also about um, the resistance and the resistance to French imperialism uh, that's so vital and not only exposing these violences, not only in resisting these violences, but working of course for an end to French empire and end to Western imperialism. And I'm just gonna take this occasion uh, before I invite my co-moderator to share some thoughts with us on this occasion uh, just to uh, quickly read her bio, it's a great pleasure, it's a great honor for me uh, to be co-moderating with you, Haria. I have a great appreciation uh, for your important uh, political and uh, work and the writing you've done. Uh, Haria is, of course, uh, well known as a founding member of the Parti de Indigene de la République. Uh, and, and a colonial political member based in France. Um, she's written numerous theoretical, strategical articles on uh, vital questions on decolonial feminism, racism, autonomy, and political alliances, as well as articles on Zionism and state feudal Semitism. And she is the author with Sadri Khiari of Nous sommes les indigènes de la République. And also of whites, Jews, and us towards a politics of revolutionary love. She recently resigned from the party, but she is still a decolonial activist. And I personally nail Haria as a great role model and an inspiration uh, as an Arab woman uh, fighting and continuing to resist, uh, of course, French imperialism, uh, particularly as someone from Lebanon. I come to you today from Beirut. And uh, with that, I wanted to ask you, Huria, if uh, there's anything uh, you'd like to add as to why it's important to commemorate the 61 massacre in this moment, uh, especially through teaching Palestine. Thank you very much for this presentation, uh, Jamila, and I'm very happy to be here with you. Uh, thank you, Jamila, for, for this invitation. Thank you, Rabab, for inviting me uh, as well. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, Youssef and I are uh, effectively acti uh, are effectively member um, co-founders of the Party of the Indigenous of the Republic, uh, which is uh, which is a decolonial party in France. And uh, what uh, what is uh, characterizing uh, this political party is that we are, of course, anti-imperialist, of course, anti-colonialist, of course anti-racist, uh, but we try to do the link between the past and the present, and we try to do the link between all uh, the, the anti-colonialist uh, experiences, experiences all over the world. And uh, as we are uh, in the same time, uh, uh, the, the children of the Algerian uh, revolution, we are in the same time, um, but for this reason, we are very close for, uh, to the to the Palestinian struggle, uh, and it's very difficult in France to be to be to to fight to 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 support the the Palestinian struggle. But as you know, we are all uh, we are all uh, accused of being anti-Semites, so it's difficult. But uh, we 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 are still here. And uh, I just want to say a word on the on the massacres of uh, October seventeenth. Uh, seventeenth, yes, uh, it's a very important political date uh, because this crime, uh, which was made here in Paris by the French police, and uh, in during uh, 
the rule of De Gaulle is very important to be recognized because uh, it means that the French state is uh, guilty for this crime. And until now, it's very difficult to make the French state recognize the, this crime as a colonial crime here in Paris. But what is interesting with this date is, is that um, this is not a crime made by um, a fascist uh, country. It is made by a democratic uh, country Republican. and a Republican part, a, a Republican uh, regime. Country. And this is uh, this is why it's so difficult for the country, for the land of the human rights, to recognize this crime. It means it means that uh, the, the 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 ideology of the human rights. It means that that the ideology of universality is not true. Is a lie, and this is why today we are still uh, trying to make the French state recognize this crime, and this is why we were demonstrating uh, in the streets of in the streets of Paris uh, last uh, last Sunday. So I just want to to introduce Youssef Youssef Boussouba, who 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 uh, who is a co-founder of this uh, of this party. Uh, which is a decolonial party, and uh, before that, it was uh, a, a very important and is still a very important supporter of the Palestinian struggle. He is, in the same time, Al uh, Algerian from Algerian um, origins, and his mother was uh, was um, uh, an activist in the 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 FLN. Uh, National Liberation Front of Algeria. National Liberation Front of Algeria. <laughs> so his own mother was in the in the movement. She's, she was a great activist, and Youssef, in in his uh, political experience, has always made the the mm -hmm. link between uh, Algeria, between the French colonialism and Palestine, and is going to to talk to you now. Hello, hello everybody. Um, I'm um, I'm sorry I can't uh, explain uh, all all this uh, story in, uh, in English. Uh, I have to do to do that in French. And it's going to be translated by uh, by Bianca. By Bianca. Hello, Bianca. Okay. Bonjour. Hello. Allez-y. On peut y aller? Oui. Oui, je vais, je vais y aller doucement. Tu m'entends bien, Bianca Oui, oui, je t'entends bien, vas-y. D'accord. Je vais y aller phrase par phrase Oui, ça peut être une phrase ou deux, trois phrases ensemble, ça, ça peut aller. D'accord, bah, tu parles très bien français. <rire> Alors, voilà, Le, nous parlons aujourd'hui du 60e anniversaire de la manifestation du 17 octobre 1961. Cette manifestation se, se déroule, euh, comme on l'a dit, en 1961, vers la fin de la guerre d'Algérie, à un moment où le FLN algérien et le gouvernement français euh, ont, sont en train de négocier de façon très difficile l'avenir de l'Algérie. C'est bon là Tu peux y aller, déjà dire ça, oui. non Oui. Um, so we're here to talk about the 60th anniversary of a demonstration that happened in Paris, uh, October 17th, uh, 1961. Uh, and was a, there was a demonstration that happened in the middle of the Algerian independence war at the moment at where- the the, end, At the end. At the end at sorry. The end. Yeah, at the end of the war, where the uh, Liberation Front uh, was negotiating with the French government um, in very difficult negotiations, the future uh, of Algeria. We can say that, that it was the, the last uh, direct line, like uh, we say in French, uh, the, the last moments. Uh, c'était les derniers moments de la, de la guerre. Et c'était donc le moment où la négociation était la plus dure, la plus difficile. Et uh, le gouvernement français, donc il y avait un rapport de force très important entre le gouvernement français et le FLN. Le FLN était aussi bien en Algérie qu'en France. En France, il y avait 400 000 Algériens environ, 
dont 150 000 dans la région parisienne, autour de Paris. Et donc, c'était un enjeu politique extrêmement important. Le FLN contrôlait ces 400 000 Algériens et qui était une ressource considérable, une ressource financière considérable pour le FLN, puisque chaque Algérien devait donner euh, environ 5 à 6 de son salaire euh, pour la cause. Bianca, non Oui. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as Youssef was saying, that negotiation happened at the very last moment uh, of the war. That was the crux of the negotiation. It was a very difficult situation because it was a matter also of the relation of forces between the Liberation Front of Algeria and the French government. And we need to know that at that very moment, in 61, uh, we had in France 400,000 Algerians living in the country, and more specifically, 150,000 living in Paris. And so one cannot underestimate the importance of mobilizing uh, French Algerians or Algerians living in France for the cause of the independence. And also the fact that uh, those Algerians were um, a source of tremendous financial support to the Liberation Front. Uh, all of them contributed uh, a part of their wages to support uh, the cause of independence. They were paying sorts of dues between five and six percent of their wages to the FLN, the Liberation Front, to support the cause of independence. So, uh, c'était un enjeu très très important. Alors, pour pour gêner, alors voilà, au gouvernement français, il y avait le général de Gaulle qui était le président, et il y avait le premier ministre Michel Debré. Et uh, et le but, comment le pour pour uh, pour essayer de contrôler la population uh, algérienne, le gouvernement français a décidé d'instaurer un couvre-feu. Couvre-feu, tu, tu comprends Couvre-feu, non Curfew, yes. Ah, ouais. euh, le, le, le gouvernement français a décidé d'instaurer un couvre-feu pour tous les Algériens à partir de 8h30 le soir. Plus aucun Algérien n'avait le droit de circuler euh, sous, risque, euh, sous risque très grave. Il risquait des choses très graves si jamais un Algérien était pris après 8h30. Le but était de contrôler la population et d'empêcher euh, la récolte euh, de l'argent, de l'argent, de l'impôt révolutionnaire. Parce que c'était généralement le soir que, que les collecteurs du FLN passaient pour récolter l'argent euh, dans, dans, dans tous les foyers algériens, vous voyez Donc le but, pour contrôler la population algérienne, un couvre-feu avait été instauré pour les Algériens seulement. Alors évidemment, comment faire la différence entre les Algériens et les autres Maghrébins, euh, Marocains et Tunisiens et même des Portugais étaient, étaient embêtés aussi à cause de cela. Donc voilà, le but était d'instaurer un couvre-feu. Le FLN, pour protester contre ce couvre-feu, a décidé eh bien, de faire une grande manifestation euh, dans Paris, dans cinq points, cinq points différents de Paris, de toutes les banlieues, de tous les bidonvilles. Euh, le FLN a demandé aux Algériens d'aller de, 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 sur Paris et de protester contre le couvre-feu. Yes, so at, at that moment in France, we, we had um, de Gaulle was, uh, Charles de Gaulle was the president of the Republic and Michel Debré was the prime minister. And something they did is that they, in, they imposed a curfew uh, only on Algerians in France. So they could not get out of the house or be in the streets by, for no reason possible after 8.30 p.m. And the point of this selective curfew against Algerians living in, in France and in Paris was specifically to prevent the collection of these dues, because usually it would be at night that the uh, militants and activists of the Liberation Front will go to people's houses to collect the money to continue the struggle for liberation. So it was to control the population, the Algerian population, and to stop the financial support of the resistance. So hearing of this drastic curfew, what the Liberation Front did was in protest to call for a very big demonstration in Paris, in five different points of the city, but actually asking not only those who live in, in the city, but also all of the population that live in the big suburbs of the city, of the city uh, to come to the city united to demonstrate against the curfew. Oui, parce que le, le montant de l'argent qui était récolté par le FLN était considérable, considérable. C'était ça qui permettait d'acheter les armes en Algérie, qui, per, qui permettait de nourrir les populations, d'aider les prisonniers aussi. Il y avait beaucoup de prisonniers. 
Donc, c'était un enjeu considérable pour le FLN, pouvoir continuer à récolter cet argent. Euh, je n'ai plus exactement en tête le montant, et il faudrait le dire en, en, en euros actuels, mais bon, il faut savoir que c'était absolument considérable et que c'était 80% euh, de, de tout l'argent du FLN. Il restait 20% qui était donné par euh, la, la Ligue arabe, hein, mais 80% était donné par la collecte, la collecte de l'argent de, de l'immigration en France, mais aussi un petit peu en Allemagne et un petit peu en Belgique. Donc, la manifestation euh, va réunir beaucoup de monde. Euh, la manifestation va réunir beaucoup de, beaucoup de monde, environ 30 000 à 40 000 personnes, euh, alors que le gouvernement va tout faire pour empêcher les gens euh, des banlieues de venir sur Paris. Euh, les gares vont être fermées, etc. Mais la répression va être absolument apocalyptique. La répression va être terrible, terrible, terrible et cela va se faire sans qu'aucune force politique française ne réagisse, ne proteste. Même le Parti communiste français va avoir une réaction très, très, très molle. En tout cas, la répression va être abominable et jusqu'à aujourd'hui, il y a un enjeu sur le nombre de morts, évidemment, mais ce nombre de morts euh, est entre 200 et 500 morts euh, beaucoup disent plutôt 500 même, et, et des milliers de blessés, et beaucoup de gens sont morts après, sont morts après de leurs blessures, parce qu'ils sont rentrés dans leur bidonville, euh, et ils n'osaient pas aller se faire soigner à l'hôpital euh, pour ne pas être arrêtés, parce qu'ensuite la police a fait le tour de tous les hôpitaux pour arrêter les gens qui étaient blessés. 12 000 personnes ont été arrêtées, donc je dis bien, entre 200 et 500 personnes tuées, 12 000 personnes arrêtées et gardées pendant plusieurs jours, dans les stades, contrôlés, sans nourriture, sans rien, sans hygiène, pour essayer de trouver chez, euh, parmi eux ceux qui étaient les commissaires politiques euh, du FLN. J'ai parlé un peu longtemps. Ça va, je prends des notes. <rire> Excuse-moi. Non, non, pas de souci. Um, so Youssef was telling us that we cannot underestimate the importance of this financial support that was given by uh, the uh, Algerian immigration in France and, 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 and in Germany and other countries. Uh, because with this money, that was the money that allowed the Liberation uh, Front to buy uh, military equipment, buy uh, guns, but also support all of the political prisoners of the liberation struggle, and also buy food and all, all forms of material support for the cause of independence. So it is calculated that uh, roughly 80% of the funds of the Liberation Front came from the immigrant uh, Algerian immigrant communities, mostly in France, but also in other countries. And the remaining 20% came from the Arab League, which was also supporting the efforts of independence. So what happened exactly in this demonstration of October 17th, 1961, um, was a very large demonstration. It's calculated between 30 and 40,000 uh, Algerians marched in Paris, um, knowing that the government did everything to stop the participation of the Algerians that were coming from the outside of the city for the working class uh, neighborhoods, um, popular neighborhoods that we call the banlieue, uh, could be equivalent of the ghetto in the US, right? Like racialized uh, communities. So they close the train stations, they prevent circulation, people arriving to Paris. But despite of those efforts, uh, there was a very big demonstration and there was also a huge, tremendous, violent repression of this demonstration. This repression that the French, no French authority ever recognized that it existed. It was kept out of you know, any possible reporting or ac acknowledgement. Um, there was no reaction of any political force uh, in, in the country to at least say what had happened. Even the French Communist Party had a very mild reaction to the massacre. Um, And we use the word massacre because Youssef is telling us that although, of course, we don't have the exact number of uh, how many people were killed, it is calculated that between 200 and 500 Algerians were murdered by the police that night. And not only we had between 200 and 500 people murdered by the police, but we had 12,000 Algerians arrested, arrested by the police, illegally detained, most of the time in huge stadiums, kept there for days to be interrogated because the police wanted to find out who were the true leaders, who were the ones working directly with the Liberation Front. And they were also being deprived of food and all the basic necessities, right? So this is um, what happened that night uh, and, and what is being asked today to be recognized, acknowledged, 
and you know dealt with. Thank right. you. Thank you, very much. Oh, Thank you very much, Milanka. We're wrapping up this round and we'll come back, of course, in the second okay. round. And welcome back, Dr. Abdelhad. You were missed, believe okay. me. Um, I don't know if you uh, if you want to say anything at the moment, or shall we uh, proceed? Okay. No, we, yeah, I'm, I, I can I can intervene later on. I'm sure you all did a great job. I'm sorry, I'm just staying at the hotel, which shut up the internet all of a sudden, of so I'm, I couldn't even join on the, my phone. So my apologies, but you know, all of you, be careful, be careful. Amazing group. So, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Abdelhadi. And thank you very much, Yusuf, for giving us uh, an important sense not only of what was happening on October 17, but of course that it had everything to do with the Algerian war. It had everything to do with repressing uh, the anti-colonial struggle, of course. And uh, of course, it had everything to do with the preoccupations of France uh, as a global empire. And we have an excellent intervention that connects what happened in Paris and in Algeria to other happenings in Guadeloupe from the brilliant Stephanie. We're gonna play that video uh, and you can uh, see her bio in the comments, of course. Uh, Stephanie Merillon René is a sociologist and performer artist who is uh, from Guadeloupe. And like I said, we're just gonna play a video since Stephanie couldn't join us today, uh, unfortunately. If we can have that uh, video up uh, any second now. And thank you, Blanca, for the excellent translation. Hi, just taking a minute to load, it seems. Uh, just so you know, Salim, we can't hear it. Okay, maybe we should come back if there's technical issues there. It seems to be uh, the case today. The internet is conspiring against us not to, not to hold this important event, but we're obviously gonna persevere. We're all known as uh, pretty tough people that way. So we'll come back to the video by Stephanie and maybe what we'll do is uh, we'll skip ahead to uh, our next speaker. If I could ask you, Blanca, to perhaps uh, step in at this moment uh, and just very quickly to introduce you aside from being an excellent on-the-spot interpreter Blanca is also assistant professor of French in the modern languages and literatures department at San Francisco State University and many other things of course and again you'll see the complete bio in the comments so uh, please go ahead Blanca this is a uh, for about five minutes we welcome you to touch base on uh, the history of what happened in 61 and of course that link of that history with uh, imperialism and resistance uh, which is our theme today thank you so much it's very important for me to be able to speak here because i do teach in a french language department and so it is important when we learn the history of french france and the language that we do it from an anti-imperialist perspective um, so when we think about the history of resistance against French imperialism, and in particular in Algeria, the Algerian independence war is a central piece of it, but there is a long history of resistance of the Algerian people. Uh, a big chunk of resistance has been deliberately erased by the French colonizers, and the project of colonization of France of Algeria was a project of settler colonialism. It was called a colonie de peuplement with a um, goal of implanting a European population in the country and erasing and destroying the native population living there. So it is really similar to the project of Israel as a uh, colonial state and trying to uh, eliminate the Palestinian population and erase its history. So the project of colonization of the island, of the, sorry, of the territory that began in 1830 was also a project of extermination of the native population recently uh, Karima Lazali, which has issued a very important book called the Trauma Colonial, Colonial Trauma, tell us that in this first moment of 
uh, from the mid 19th century to the beginning of the Algerian war, a third of the native population of Algeria was killed and murdered by the French colonizers, a third of the native population. But there was strong resistance. And I've been reading recently a novel uh, by Abdelkader Jemaï, La Dernière Nuit de l'Emir, The Last Night of the Emir, that shows all of this resistance against the project of colonization of Algeria. But there was also huge resistance at the end of World War II because um, the subjects of the French colonies were forced to participate in the war efforts to supposedly save uh, France, which was supposedly this free republic, the country that did the revolution for human rights. Uh, of course, French people fail to say that they actively collaborated with the Nazi authorities to deport millions and millions of Jews uh, and voluntarily send workers to support the war efforts of Germany. So at the end of the war, all of these Algerians, Senegalese, Tunisians, Moroccans who had fought for what they thought was a project of freedom and emancipation, many of the times recruiting by force, they demanded their rights. They're demanding that they too wanted human rights and the right of living a free nation to be respected. And so there were big demonstrations in 1945 in Setif and other cities um, demanding um, independence. And these demonstrations were brutally repressed. Uh, so the history of resistance is there because you cannot understand oppression without understanding resistance. And so part of the work we need to do today is to recuperate this history of resistance. But maybe the last things I want to say today are about the discussions that are happening today in France about how do we acknowledge or we don't acknowledge what happened in the city, in Paris, in the heart of the Republic um, 60 years ago. Because President Macron just did a ceremony saying like he acknowledged that there was a massacre, that they think that was really bad, that that was contrary to the values of the Republic. But he did like a half acknowledgement. Uh, he forgot or deliberately chose not to say very important things that everybody was expecting him to say. He forgot to say that this was a state crime. He forgot to mention the role of the police. He forgot to mention the colonial framework of where this massacre happened. He forgot to mention that Maurice Papon, who was leading the French police uh, the, at the, in the city at the time, was the appointed préfet de police, the head of police of the city. And more importantly, he um, is avoiding by all means to hold acknowledged responsible be, be in front of the courts, all of those policemen and all of the people responsible for this murder because they need to face the crimes they did. Um, and in particular, the fact that the French government covered it up, not covered it up in subtle ways, uh, covered it up by refusing and repressing any attempt to discuss this publicly in the city. And I think as Youssef was going to say, say um, that uh, event massacre that happened in 61 is the largest massacre occurred in France continental territory ever in history carried out by the French government against its own citizens or the population living uh, in the country. So we cannot understand what happened in, in 61 and we cannot process what happened in 61 if we don't at the same time understand the colonial violence that the French state was exercising against Algerians first, second against Muslims and against all of the French citizens. And so I think that um, this discussion is not over because unfortunately, uh, the French government refuses to really deal with the facts of what happened in 61. And I'll stop uh, my remarks there. If we have extra time, I know Youssef wanted to continue uh, speaking, so I can cede two of my minutes to him. Youssef, you're muted. Yes. Yes, please. Uh... En français. Oui, c est, c est, c est, tu as exactement dit euh, ce qu'il fallait dire. Euh, J'ajoute simplement que, euh, que la responsabilité euh, n'est pas que de Papon. Pendant longtemps, on a dit c'est le préfet Maurice Papon, c'est le préfet Maurice Papon. Euh, ce que je dis, moi, je, en même temps, on a fait un petit peu de, de, de recherche, il faut aussi de, de l'histoire. Et, et, et euh, il est évident que ce massacre euh, se fait sous la responsabilité de Michel Debré et du général de Gaulle, qui tous les deux avaient intérêt à ce massacre pour des raisons différentes. Hein au niveau des négociations d'Evian, pour pouvoir négocier à Evian euh, en position de force. Euh, Michel Debré, lui, était complètement opposé aux négociations. 
mais le général de Gaulle a laissé faire cela, c'est indéniable. Personne en France n'ose mettre en cause le général de Gaulle aujourd'hui. Et pendant trop longtemps, eh bien, on se contente de dire que le responsable, c'est Maurice Papon, euh, comme si euh, le préfet de police aurait pu prendre une telle décision. Hein. Ensuite, de Gaulle, d'ailleurs, a, a poursuivi, a, a, comment, a maintenu Maurice Papon dans ses, ses fonctions. La deuxième chose que je voulais dire, c'est que les Algériens qui ont été tués, euh, en fait, ce sont des Français d'origine algérienne, parce que depuis 1958, tous avaient la citoyenneté française. Donc l'erreur, enfin, que souvent, qui est faite volontairement par Macron, en plus dans son, dans son, dans son euh, communiqué de l'Élysée, c'est de dire que ce sont des Algériens. Non, c'était des Français d'origine algérienne. Ça veut dire que c'est un État démocratique qui a tué ses propres citoyens de façon horrible, ils ont été noyés, lancés, euh, noyés dans la Seine, pendus au bois de Boulogne, euh, tire, comment, abattus avec euh, la mitraillette, etc. Et ce qui, a, ce qui est grave, c'est que le gouvernement refuse de reconnaître cela pour évi évidemment éviter des poursuites au plan international. Ça, c'est important de le dire. Donc voilà, c'est un gouvernement qui a massacré ses propres citoyens, qui ne veut pas le reconnaître euh, 60 ans après, et, et évidemment pour ne pas avoir de, de poursuites. Voilà. Yeah, so Youssef is adding that um, usually the person who is held responsible now by Macron from this massacre is Maurice Papon, who was the head of police. But actually, this on, one cannot imagine that Papon would have decided this on his own without having the explicit authorization and the cover of the prime minister, uh, Michel Debré, who was publicly opposed to any form of negotiation with the FLN uh, to end the war and uh, without the goal knowing. That is to say that their political responsibility is very important. They need to be acknowledged that De Gaulle, uh, the president of the Republic, and De Bray uh, were also complicit of this crime, that they were using this massacre to increase the relation of forces during, during the negotiation. And it's still impossible today to point the finger at De Gaulle and say that he had something to do with this. And the second thing Youssef is sharing with us is that um, we need to understand that those murders were uh, occurred against French citizens because the Algerians um, immigrants who were living in, in, in France were granted citizenship in 1958, French citizenship. So they all were also French citizens. So we have here a situation where a state is murdering its own citizens and refuses still today to recognize that they were French citizens murdered by the French police in order not to have to face the consequences. Uh, of, of such actions. And uh, you just like some things that uh, Youssef said that, you know, the, the, the way that they were, they were murdered was also very brutal. And they were not only shot at, sometimes they were hanged. Sometimes they were like thrown, wounded to the river. So they will be, they were drawn in the river. So it was a, a very violent uh, and brutal repression and murder. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf, for adding that important point. Uh, it's very, very vital to make sure that we don't make it as uh, the French state wants about a single man. This is a political system. This is a political project. And uh, it's not about the mayor or the prefect or what have you uh, whatsoever. So uh, at this point, what I'm going to try to do is uh, play Stephanie's video one more time. Again, it's a very important intervention, uh, very important to think about Guadeloupe in 67 in relation to what happened in Paris in 61. Okay, it looks like it's working. So let's go ahead. Thank you, Salim. Greetings to you all. My name is Stéphanie Minorinet. I'm a PhD sociologist and artivist. I'm a choreographer, performer, and writer. I'm honored to be part of this uh, panel, and I would like to thank um, Rabab uh, Abdulladi and Jamila Gadar for coordinating this venue. And I would like to thank as well uh, Hassan Mezin for recommending me for this encounter. For May 67, May 67, as we say in Creole, this is how we, this episode is evoked in our history. We can see here the expression of um, a psyche wounded by years of oppression, bondage, subjugating violence. In 2018, I was asked to partake in a venue around those events in the shape of a film projection uh, and a performance. So that was a documentary of uh, Guadeloupian um, 
filmmaker Mike Horn, entitled May 67, Le Thierry Patrick des Enfants de la République, was broadcast in, in a retirement home with um, the hope that we will have a very interesting and enriching uh, exchange about this event. Uh, this was a disappointment as uh, the seniors attending was stricken by amnesia, not because of their advanced age, but as a consequence of the violence of the massacre, a kind of PTSD effect. When elders are asked out about this period, they will say that they do not remember it, that they do not know about it. However, they would have lived in Guadeloupe during these events. So what are the facts? In the 1960s, Guadeloupe and metropolitan France um, can be observed since the end of the Second World War um, with the emergence of nationalist movements in the associate third world. After the negative movement initiated by Martinican poet and philosopher Aimé Césaire, Senegalese poet and philosopher Leopold Sédar Senghor, and French Guyanese poet and philosopher Léon Gontran Damas, a new wave of French Caribbean intellectuals appeared. We see the intellectual side of the nationalist movement, the nationalist revolution. <clears throat> On the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, there are proletarian movements struggling for better work conditions and questioning per se the colonial system uh, still at work in the labor world, besides nourished both by the intellectual developments in uh, metropolitan France in their communities abroad and <clears throat> by the feelings from their parents and families' work conditions, students also organize themselves to protest against colonialism. In the 1960s, there is a pressure on the French government and more specifically on the heirs of the colonial era, so say the decay, descendants of the colonizers monopolistically owning the island trades. So uh, the anti-colonial maronage dynamics are changing just as the system is changing in its labeling, but not in its structure, in its form. So um, a lot of events happened in the 1960s, between the 1961 event and the 1967 event. There is a 1963 Bumidum uh, project of the government, which is, as Aimé Césaire said, um, a genocide by substitution. So on May 26 and May 27, 1967, uh, in, the, in the streets of Pointe-à-Pitre and on Place de la Victoire, Fizi Palais Français, as we say in Guadeloupe and Creole, which means the gun spoke French, a very colorful expression that says that violence is always the work of the genocidal colonies. The French state puts an end in blood to a demonstration of workers demanding a salary increase of 2.5%. They show us like rabbits, told me this old man sitting outside uh, at the gerontological hospital of pointe à pitre refusing to watch this documentary relating the facts of May 67, which we projected for them, for us to remember all together. We did not know that we were inflicting torture on them, we rekindled a wound so deeply buried that its mere mention brought the facts back to an unbearable vividness. On Place de la Victoire in Pointe-à-Pitre, a large fresco recalls the massacre. This is the imprint of a story that we never want to forget. And this is really interesting because this is something that is redundant in our history. Each time there is a big strike and big revolts in Guadeloupe, which is something that has happened I mean, many times, for example, in 2009 with the general strike that lasted 44 days, or in any case, for example, recently with the COVID-19 crisis, a lot of um, militaries were um, called in in Guadeloupe to repress the, demonstra the demonstrations. And this is something that each time there is a strike in Guadeloupe, there is a recall, a reminder of what happened in May 67. And um, generally speaking, you will hear the, um, the activists or the militants or the, na the nationalists say that the French government will send Marblo, Marblo, which is the Creole word for um, the military police, the gendarmerie or CRS. I think that is correct to say that 
um, those are events that are intrinsically linked regarding the French history. First of all, history is a continuum, despite the willingness of the French government to abolish memories, to abolish history. It was more of an erasure of history from the consciousness of the colonized and colonizers, at least of their descendants. It is impossible to obliterate facts and we say memories. Colonialism is embroidered in the lifestyles and the administrative structures of our society. Because um, time is also a form of colonization, it is history, it is part of our histories, enslavement, May 67, and all the repressions that we bleed are still really vivid in our memories and our um, daily lives. So, because it's only 173 years since the abolition of slavery, and I would say, that we are French citizens, I mean, considered French citizens since 1946, which is not even a century yet. This is quite clear, the link that can be made between October 17, 1961 and May 67 in Guadeloupe. Um, this is a history of uh, repression and terror by the French government, thank you for this um, opportunity to have a more pedagogical approach of May 67 and it, um, I would say an opportunity to make that part of our history best known abroad and for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, wherever you are, really appreciate it. Really appreciate all your amazing flexibility getting this video to us on such short notice. Um, just to connect uh, this uh, important intervention to some of the earlier comments, like Yusuf mentioned, the people massacred in Guadeloupe were also French citizens. This is the murder of French citizens by the French state. And also, as is the case with the massacre in 61 in Paris of Algerians, many of the police, many of the politicians uh, were originally uh, were also in Algeria itself, were trained, uh, operated as police in, in Algeria, including the governor of Guadeloupe at the time, Pierre Boulet, who uh, earned himself a fearful reputation for his role in the the brutal French violence against the Algerian resistance in Algeria itself. And so uh, at this point, I'm going to move on to our next speaker. Uh, we're so glad to have you with us today, Felix. Uh, Felix is assistant professor at the University of California at Irvine, uh, African diaspora who specializes in African American history. And of course, in the comments. I know there's a bit of sound. I think that might, uh, okay, I'm gonna try muting, hopefully that'll go. Hi, um, thank you all for having me. Um, and I just kinda, what I'm gonna talk about is gonna echo a lot of what people said, but I'm gonna start it um, a few centuries in the past. And this is how a country like Haiti, at one time the French colony of Saint-Domingue is connected to a place like Algeria, some 7,500 kilometers, 4,700 miles apart. And it's French colonialism that unites the Caribbean and Africa and North Africa in these, um, in these ways. And um, I wanna point out that French colonialism has two major tropes that we should follow that lead us to 1961. Um, first is a silence, erasure, um, or basically a cover by French notions of uh, humanism, uh, democratic practices, inclusivity. Um, and the second is the violence. Uh, French colonialism, like all colonialisms, are violent endeavors. So when um, Am Ami Césaire writes discourses on colonialism and he compares, uh, he says that Hitlerism is the conclusion of the colonial project, um, he is correct, except that in, when he writes that, he has not seen the worst of French colonialism that the Algerians and the Vietnamese will come to know. 
But French colonialism begins in the early part of the 17th century in Martinique and Guadeloupe. And the first victims of this violence uh, were the indigenous populations. And the French, uh, uh, in a tie of the military, the government, and uh, economic interest, uh, worked on a, a propaganda machine that went to, de to, to describe these indigenous people as, quote, savages, as needing the, the Western civilization to bring them into the future. It's tropes that we'll hear across and across. And of course, immediately they conduct a genocide of, or part of the larger European genocide of the uh, indigenous Americans in Guadeloupe and Martinique. And the practices there, they take with them. They rule uh, Martinique, for example, and Guadeloupe by violence. And whenever the French are threatened, or they imagine themselves threatened, I should say, they, they reply with uh, total violence. And this becomes the norm. French colonialism in the Caribbean explodes uh, with Haiti, uh, then the colony of Saint-Domingue, which becomes a French possession at the end of the 17th century. Now, Saint-Domingue becomes one of the richest colonies in the history of the world. It is known as the Pearl of the Antilles, the, the Pearl des Antilles. Uh, and this is based on the labor of enslaved Africans. And I don't want to exceptionalize what happened on uh, Saint-Domingue and plantations, but French slavery was a particularly violent affair, slavery in general. The chattel slavery of Africans in the Americas was a particularly violent affair. In the hundred years or so that Haiti was a French colony from about 1697 through uh, 1804, but until 1791, I should say, with the beginning of the Haitian Revolution, more than a million enslaved Africans were brought to this colony. And by the time of the, the Revolutionary War began, only 5,000 of them were still alive. And in the years preceding the war, close to 200,000 had been brought in. So a French colonial plantation ruled by consuming the enslaved population. And the enslaved population was always much larger than the plantocracy. And so how do you control such a large people, large amount of people is to abject violence. So any threat to the plantation order was met with severe punishment. Heads were chopped off, people were brutally whipped and other things that I won't recount here. And so violence hung over um, the plantations and the plantations on Guadeloupe and Martinique. But in 1791, uh, the enslaved Africans in, in Saint-Domingue revolted and they would never come back. And the French response to it was brutal. And it is a brutal war. And this is a point that maybe I'll come back to later. The people who resisted colonialism, they were not angels. And we have to remind ourselves that the colonial project makes demons out of all of us. And so the resistance was brutal. And that France broadcasted to the international. Yet the violence of the plantation slavery was silenced. Uh, the, in fact, the whole Haitian Revolution has been silenced, and we can talk about Michel Rothschild's book, Silencing the Past, and we're talking about silencing. But something happens along the way. Then 1793, I think the date is, they found the L'Ecole Polytechnique, and this is a colonial institute where colonial domination begins to become routinized, scientific, and violence becomes the tool that is used again and again. So when Napoleon sends troops to Haiti, Leclerc and Rochambeau, with the idea to reinstate slavery, they proceed to attack the Haitian population. Now, even those who supported uh, the, oh, well, okay, even those who supported the French presence in the colony, they began to kill indiscriminately. And this is what made the opposite sides come together to um, overthrow the French. And this is a, the, the, the project that they came to instill in, in 1830 when they arrived in Algeria. And this is the same mentality, and I'm skipping a lot here, that when, they, when Papua came in 1858 was the culmination of this, that they put down what they perceived to be a threat to, to French, French, French people with abject violence to remind the brown citizens that they need to stay in their place and not be a threat to the state. And um, I'll leave it there.
Thank you, Felix. We look forward to your further comments in the next rounds. And of course, there is no doubt that without the wealth and the enslaved labor in Haiti and Saint-Domingue, France would never have had an industrial revolution, would never have had the French Revolution, uh, which itself was, of course, shaped thoroughly by the Haitian Revolution, what was happening in Haiti. So we get a strong sense of uh, the motivation behind all this erasure and forgetting. Uh, I think we're going to move on now to Brahim's uh, video. We have uh, another video intervention by Brahim Luba, <coughs> co-founder and former head of the UK-based Algeria Solidarity Campaign and is also currently completing a PhD in political science at CUNY Grad Center. And again, his bio will be in the comments. If we uh, can uh, give Salim just a second to uh, set us up with that next video. Okay, here we are. Great. Thank you, Salim. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you to the organizers for uh, putting together this, uh, this event and uh, for um, thinking about uh, commemorating the, uh, the, uh, the massacres of October 17, 1961. Thank you also to all of you who have uh, taken the time to, to be here with us today. Um, what I wanted to contribute today uh, is um, how I personally, uh, as an Algerian, personally experienced this uh, October 17th uh, in 2021. And uh, uh, of course, I'll have since since the organizers have accorded me 45 minutes. So I should be able to do that um, thoroughly. Just kidding. Um, I only have a few minutes, so it will have to be a schematic, um, a schematic way of going about this. And uh, I'll have to cut some corners and uh, be reductionist in some ways. Um, so this 17th of October, 2021, uh, let's start with, with the official uh, the official commemorations. So in in uh, in, in France, um, uh, the uh, the French president uh, Macron has made some statements in which um, he called the the events uh, or the massacre. He called it uh, something that is uh, unacceptable, but he attributed it to. Uh, Papon, uh, i.e., making it a uh, making it a um, an issue that is that is uh, only restricted to the, to the municipality to Paris. That's something that the the préfet of Paris has done, as opposed to a French state a crime that is committed by the French state. Um, uh, it's uh, it, it is obvious that something of that magnitude could not have happened uh, without the the uh, the uh, green light um, uh, of, of the of the French state at, at the time so uh, so you've, you've had the, you've had that and that shows you trying to make it a municipal issue as opposed uh, uh, to to a state or national issue uh, shows you the unreadiness or unwillingness of uh, official France to uh, to recognize uh, its colonial crimes and to um, let alone let alone uh, uh, give reparations or or, or move forward uh, beyond that. Um, so that's on on the uh, on the st on sort of the uh, French side. On the Algerian side, you had a a, a minute of silence. Um, and that was the official. Uh, the official response to, to uh, or the official way of commemorating um, these massacres. But sort of beyond the empty shell of official solemnity and, and uh, you know, the laying out of flowers and wreaths and, uh, you know, the official way of memorializing uh, these, uh, these massacres and these lives um, to truly uh, for uh, you know to truly honor the the memory of of the people who died who were tortured who were imprisoned um in 61 
is is to to highlight uh, their struggle, what they were struggling for, and why. Um, what were they trying to achieve, and what were they uh, uh, prepared to sacrifice to achieve that? So, and also to think about it in ways as how can it serve us today? Uh, how can we operationalize it? How can it be a positive energy for struggles uh, that are that are aiming to achieve uh, similar goals? So, if we think about what those Algerians were doing on that fateful October 7, 1761, uh, we can at least very schematically again uh, think uh, that there, were, there was an immediate goal, uh, which was protesting the curfew that was imposed on Algerians uh, in, in France at the time. That's sort of the immediate um, uh, uh, sort of demand is, or, or the uh, grievance. Uh, this restriction of movement, restriction of their rights, and uh, and, and so on. Um, on the intermediate uh, sort of uh, level would be the national question. Self-determination Algerians were protesting uh, for their self-determination. They were active. They were struggling for their self-determination, and that is sort of the context that uh, that or the backdrop against which. Uh, these, uh, this, uh, that protest was was held, and the FLN's uh, implication in in organizing it. Uh, the third uh, and larger sort of goal is to assert their humanity and uh, their right to enjoy uh, their humanity and to live dignified lives um, to the full. So the colonial um, response to that. Uh, was violence, um, violence, uh, arrests, shootings, torture, imprisonment, and drowning in the in the Seine in the uh, in, in Paris. And uh, so, what is what also we can take out from or extract from the colonial um, uh, response is uh, its DNA, uh, the 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 organizing idea behind it is a denial, an attitude. A denial of of the humanity of colonized peoples. Uh, they are not treated as humans. This is a statement on their humanity, or actually the the, the lack thereof, and the, a denial of their right to self determine, to decide for themselves, and to live in the world in a world of their own making. And the, the third would be their freedoms, freedom of movement, freedom of speech, in this case, and and, and so on. So, for Algerians, for Algerians today, uh, you know, for the past, some of you might uh, might know, for the past uh, two and a half, over two and a half years, Algerians have been um, in the streets uh, to dislodge a, a military oligarchy, a, a comprador military oligarchy that is French-backed uh, and foreign-backed, um, and uh, which continues to deny Algerians their. Uh, their right to self-determine, to their humanity, and to their to their freedoms. Um, so, uh, on on uh, on October seventeenth this year, Algerians were banned from marching uh, in uh, in the streets of Algeria to commemorate um, this uh, this uh, this massacre. Uh, on October seventeenth, in fact, uh, uh, the Algerian Coast Guard. Um, um, is accused of uh, drowning uh, a four, uh, actually, yeah, uh, five five people uh, trying to cross to the northern shores of the Med Mediterranean. Um, a couple, their daughter, and their unborn baby, as well as a young soccer players who were in uh, whose whose boat was uh, hit by by a coast guard boat and split into two. Um, killing four four people uh, and uh, injuring others. Um, also, uh, since January January of this year, uh, estimates put it at eighteen thousand Algerians who tried uh, to uh, to cross uh, to the other side of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean with at least five hundred people uh, died. 
So to some extent, the, uh, it's only the actors and the locales that have changed of this colonial violence. Um, uh, extern externally, uh, it has moved from the sands of the drowning, still happens, uh, and is still sort of, um, uh, still, still uh, uh, a policy or a way of dealing uh, with, with Algerians and colonized people, uh, peoples uh, more generally. But instead of it being in the Seine uh, in, in Paris, now it happens in the Mediterranean. Um, and internally, uh, internally also uh, in, in, in France, uh, it has been delocalized again from the Seine, but maybe moved to the Bondieu as the, uh, the, the picture in, in front of you that demonstrates. So Algeria today, um, uh, its resources, natural resources uh, like gas and oil are largely controlled, still largely controlled by French companies like Total. Uh, key airports and infrastructures are, are uh, run and hence controlled by French uh, companies. Um, French automobile uh, industry is kept afloat by the, the Algerian administration and uh, equipment, equipping uh, the repressive apparatuses. Uh, it, Algeria's airspace is open to the French military and other militaries to, to maintain African um, African neighbors uh, under the yoke of, of colonialism. The okay, well, uh, I think the video was uh, a little bit ended a little bit abruptly, but uh, I do want to thank Brahim. Thank you very much for sending that video and linking it to what's been happening today. Uh, of course, the ongoing struggle within Algeria for uh, a better life and uh, for an end to uh, the various ways in which uh, the colonial legacies or ongoing colonialism uh, is still very much a fight that needs to be waged. I want to invite my co-moderators to perhaps uh, say a few words before we move on to the next round with our panelists, the next round of questions. Uh, perhaps I can invite you, Huria, to uh, step into the conversation. Yes, I just want to, to, to make a comment. Uh, as, um, as, you, uh, as you know, and as decolonial, uh, we are not satisfied about the the statement of uh, Macron on the on the crime of uh, October the seventeenth. Uh, but uh, you have to know that uh, the far right is very furious about what he said. So there is here a very big tension between anti anti racist and the far right, and there is a big tension also on Macron about all these issues and is and 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 is very and it's even even from his point of view it's very difficult to uh, to recognize the 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 the, the, state, the state crime because the far right is now in france hegemonic you have to know that uh, we think that uh, marine le pen or eric zemmour which who is um, more racist than uh, Marine Le Pen. He, he's more he, extremist. Uh, he's more extremist. Is almost a fascist. Uh, is going to 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 present himself to the um, to the president to the to the presidency. So we are here in a very big tension, uh, and uh, and uh, and we don't know what is going to to, to happen. And it's very. Uh, there is a, we are all very scared about what is going to happen thank you Huria. it's very uh, much a living question right now uh, the politics of memory in france it's all about how politics is playing out today and of course the battle uh the battle over power the battle over history you know i think so much of our comments today and so much of why we're hosting uh, this open class is to counter the erasures and all the ways in which France 
wants to and needs to uh, forget and get us all to forget um, the fact that there's uh, violence and racism and colonial predation at its core. Like you said earlier, Haria, it really shows the lie of the Republican claim that France is somehow defined by liberty, fraternity, equality, what have you. Uh, I think always as an archivist, uh, I'm an archivist, professional archivist and an archivist scholar, uh, I think often of all that it takes to erase that history. Uh, we know, for example, that, um, for example, that there's been a huge battle uh, internationally, uh, headlines internationally, a uh, very notorious battle over the archives that France took out of Algeria on the eve of decolonization in 61-62. A uh, huge battle over the fact that the archives, the police records of 61 have never been revealed. And of course that was the case with all the archives as France was leaving all of its colonies uh, in the 1560s, 70s. Of course that was the case as all the European powers uh, we're leaving uh, the colonies, their various colonies, Britain and Kenya, Dutch, what have you. Uh, and its um, archives have been held secret. Archives have been destroyed. Uh, it's just one aspect of a larger campaign uh, that includes media manipulation, censorship, official denial, outright secrecy, killing people to, to erase these histories. Uh, so that we can't uh, think very clearly, for example, about the fascist threat in France today uh, and the fact that there's nothing exceptional about that kind of politics in the so-called republic. Um, I'm just offering that as, as part of also emphasizing why it's so important to have you all here with us. Uh, we know what happened in 61 because of activists and historians and people like yourselves uh, who have told the story against the official lies. And uh, of course, uh, teaching Palestine, this class is part of that. It's part of that intervention. And everyone in the audience here with us today is participating in that resistance, the counter narrative, the counter archive. Uh, and so uh, perhaps I'll turn it over to Rabab for any comments, Dr. Abdel Hadi as well. Thank you. And I'm really sorry for that technical uh, difficulty. All of a sudden, the hotel were, were displaced at all of a sudden their internet broke down. I couldn't even do it on the phone. So I just wanted to actually just make a few comments before we move to the, to the uh, next uh, discussion. Uh, and I'm not sure what, what I missed from uh, my colleagues, but I wanted to say the whole question, just maybe bring in the whole co comparative aspect of it and think about it in terms of uh, maybe a couple of locations uh, that um, uh, we're focusing on in particular, uh, the, the, in, I'm talking Ahmed studies and teaching Palestine, is the US context and the context of uh, Palestine or the settler colonial project of Zionism in, in Palestine. So one of the issues I think is very interesting is the whole question of the curfew. And I was immediately, when I was like thinking about this a lot, I was thinking about the curfews that were placed more recently uh, in 2014 in Ferguson against the um, black protesters after the killing of my uh, Mike uh, Brown. And also again in Minneapolis, uh, two summers ago after the killing and the murder of George Floyd and continue to be placed. So we've seen them again and again repeated in multiple contexts and so on. And how is it that repressive forces tend to use all of these uh, tools in order to basically suppress any kind of resistance? This is also the history of um, um, not only uh, Israeli um, uh, occupation, racism and colonialism in Palestine, but also previously the British colonial powers and also in other contexts of the world. So if we want to actually do comparative, it will be very much over there. So that's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is the ways in which um, not, they tend to minimize numbers of uh, victims. Part of it has to do, which, which is the lack of value of life that uh, which, you know, Fanon's talks about a lot and many people talk about it and, and people talk about it in their experiential um, uh, knowledge of uh, indigeneity and uh, colonialism, classical colonialism and settler colonialism in the ways in which the value of the people, the indigenous, the communities of color, the people on the ground and so on is not ever seen as valuable to the lives of uh, the members of the colonial 
um, group and so on. So there is that. There is always minimization of the number, but it also has another uh, very um, important material uh, function is that in a way to kind of say we're not, we're so humanitarian, we're so civilized, we're so better than everybody else, we don't kill. And we've actually seen that again and again. When the United States, uh, particularly in Israel, every single time there is uh, trying to attempt to justify the murder of indigenous, black, indigenous people of color, third world communities, any colonized communities, Palestinians by Israel and so on, there is always a justification that we're only doing this because we're really forced to. You are forcing us to do that. We would never have done it. But because we come from such a, like a more civilized um, context and you come from a more quote unquote savage context, we are trying to save lives, but you actually never save lives, which also speaks to what uh, uh, Felix was talking about in terms of the, um, the ways the violence, what kind of violence, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. I think it's, it's an important issue. Uh, maybe the last, uh, the third uh, point is the whole question of the archives and the whole theft of the archives. You spoke about that, uh, Jamila, people spoke about it again and again, and I can also talk about the history of uh, theft of archives, not only by colonial powers and also France. I mean, the whole question, there is a debate going on right now, not a debate, actually a demand by artists for all colonial powers to return the, 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 the art that they've stolen. Again and again and again, there is uh, France and Macron tries to pretend that he is the most uh, sort of like liberal minded and so on. And I'm com completely agree with what uh, um, Youssef and Tahriya said about Zemmour and Marie Le Pen and so on. Uh, it just is still, I mean, the, the, the way in which in that you either actually stop completely against racism, colonialism and, um, and the xenophobia and the killing of indigenous and communities of color or you actually go along with it and try to show that you are a better, sort of like a better model for that, but also continue to reproduce this, which is quite uh, quite prominent. But I also want to uh, point to the ways in which historically also Israel has stolen the archives. They're actually now trying to prevent the discussions of the Deir Yassin massacre in 1948 uh, in the, in the, as they declassified the archives, but also they stole the archives of the Institute for Palestine Studies, in 1982, during the invasion, they stole stolen before. Uh, Abu Jihad Museum for Prisoners Affairs at Al-Quds University, one site where we went during the Teaching Palestine delegation 2018, uh, the, the, where, which has houses, uh, products, and writings, and notes by prisoners. Uh, the, uh, at, at that point when we met, the director told us, who's a former prisoner, spent 10 years in prison himself, uh, Dr. Abu al-Hajj, he said that there is at least 100,000 pieces of works that belong to Palestinian prisoners that Israelis refused the prison, Israel prison authorities refused to actually release to uh, Palestinians. Uh, I, I, I have um, uh, more things, but I, will, I want to only stop now at one, at a couple of points that Yusuf, you mentioned the whole question of the money and the dues. And this is also the question of how criminalizing it becomes by colonial power, by repressive power, by, by uh, suppressive uh, authorities to actually prevent uh, communities to contribute to the well-being of other communities. Meanwhile, the so-called charity that might be given by uh, by France or or by the United States or by uh, European Union or US uh, uh, AID, US Inter Agency for International Development, is seen as if it is the best thing that has happened and as if they're doing it as charity. But the solidarity among uh, communities and so on is completely. Uh, prevented. I don't know if you talked about this. I'm not sure if I missed it or so on. But uh, and if I, if you did, forgive me. But I wanted to also point out to the um, to the ways in which the French uh, state has crushed the big uh, protest in February 1962, a few months uh, after the massacre against Algerians, and they basically uh, killed eight or nine protesters. It was a protest that was organized by the Communist Party, other Socialist Party, and other groups, and so on. They crushed it, and it was against fascism. They crushed it, and then uh, in, in, re in response to it, the left organized a very massive the, um, uh, funeral arrangements, which, is, which uh, drew half a million people. Uh, the, and, 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 and this was also, I mean, the, the fascist was also against Sartre and so on. But I think maybe at one point, maybe towards the end, we can discuss about what do we think about the positions, the contradictory positions of various left, and where should they be in terms of 
um, upholding and supporting the right of indigenous people to their own uh, rights and self-determination and uh, resistance and the whole uh, question of quote unquote Islam or leftism that the French state has been raising Macron and his Ministry of Education and so on is at stake. And I will stop at that and maybe um, suggest it to go to um, maybe, I don't know, Jamila or Jorge want to go to the next set of questions so we can, I, I know that uh, Felix wanted to speak and maybe everybody wants also to speak. So do you want to take it away, uh, Jorge or Jamila? And then, yeah. Okay, thank you, Bob. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Felix to go next. Uh, perhaps we can ask people to uh, think about uh, from this history, from these comments so far, how do we understand resistance then? What, what constitutes resistance and, and how intellectual research and pedagogical praxis like our event today can challenge colonial repression and center narratives of marginalized communities? So, and, and what do we do about it? Uh, it's, a, it's a big question, but I also need to add your comments earlier, Felix. Hi, thank you. Um, so I find uh, Haria a little bit generous. I see fascists all around me um, and uh, various heads of capitalist states. It's not only for the Francos, for the um, Stenio Vincennes in Haiti. There's petit bourgeois and there's gun bourgeois. There's petit fascist and gun fascist. Let's call them as we see it as somebody who's living under a fascist regime in the United States. Um, and I think also we have to take a turn on colonialism because Colonialism has this over there quality to it. Um, you have to cross the sea, you have to cross an ocean. And in that time, uh, events can get di di distorted, diluted. But beginning after the First World War, you have colonial people in the metropole. And so now this becomes a threat to the metropole from the beginning. And again, the colonial educations where you see somebody of, of brown skin and you immediately see them as savage, as a threat, comes to bear in 61. Because anytime more than two brown people, North African, Central African, wherever, come together, it's an assault. And so this is why you get what you have in 61. And the, and the, the answer is this. It's no question that pa Papon, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, was a veteran of the Algerian War. They brought him here for a reason to enact this violence on people whenever more than one get together. This is what it is. And the last thing to touch on the questions as to why is it the fascists are running and not the left, uh, as there was a, a uh, question from the audience, it's because the people are afraid. Colonial racist education makes you afraid of the others in your presence. And so of course they want a fascist to, to cut off the power, the presence, the numbers, the ability of the other to express themselves, whether it's religiously or other. And this is why I think this has arise. The same thing here, where you had a Trump that emerges on this sort of uh, specious ideology of a browning of America. And Trump is on that because now the other is showing at your, at your footsteps. And if you all didn't see it, and I'll end here, uh, a few weeks ago, there were Haitians who were being whipped at the border, like in the days of slavery, because they had transgressed and had re entered the United States. And so this is what violence does in the metropole. You know, violence in the colony is something that can be hidden and quieted. In the metropole, it must serve a function of having the ideology of preserving the metropole as a, a white space. I'm gonna invite Blanca to give our comments next, and then we'll go to Brahim and Yusuf, I think. Um, thank you. Yes, I have so many things to say about our role here. I do think that um, one of the contributions that is important that we make is to understand um, how some of the big difficulties today in France to solve uh, even, for example, the problem, the fact that in France, even to say that there is Islamophobia, there is a debate around it. It's it's, it's like mind blowing, right? Like people argue about it. Like it. So how people can be so blind, right, to something that is so present? And so we do need. It's a little bit like the same discussion with Zionism, right? So we need to ask, how do we make that visible then, right? And that means reconstructing this 
um, repressed history, right? Because if you're speaking of um, the fact that a state can kill its own citizens because they're Muslim, right? Uh, and don't recognize them as citizens, meaning that you cannot be French and Muslim at the same time, right? You're already like doing this separation of identity and this incompatibility, right? It is done by the French government during the colonial period and during the liberation um, war. And so the debates we have today need to be articulated to this dichotomy that was established by the Republic and not really addressed. Uh, and therefore has to question what is the nature of this Republic? Uh, something that, you know, when I teach anti-colonial French history, I teach a class on social movements. There is something that is really puzzling about at least the 20th century of France, but we could also say the same thing about the 19th century, is that it is so-called a Republic that has lived in state of exception so many times. For example, the fact that the censorship law that was installed in France in 1955 made it that a lot of positions were not be able to be articulated in the public space. You could not take a stance for Algerian independence in the public space, in the news, in the press, in the publications, in the universities, how many books were censored, right? Like the book, uh, La Question by Henri Alec, but there's so many others. There's so many others, films. So, so what kind of democracy is a democracy where French citizens cannot express and debate things publicly? The most important things that they have to be debating, they cannot debate. And so that's the whole history. I mean, you could say of the 20th century. Um, and and uh, and then I think this is that needs to be reckoned with because the fact that we cannot have these debates today in France. I mean, apparently we're having them, but in fact we're not having these debates. What we're having is like violent fascist aggression being displayed 24/7 on television and all the mass media, making everybody intimidated. Like, like you know, like there's two sides here, and they're out for you, and they're out to kill you, and the state is out to repress you. And so the state of terror, like is a colonial terror that is being installed in, 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 the, in the French population today. So that's something very important because I do think we have a role to articulate a space where we can have discussions about how this republic has been constructed. And there are some folks who are trying to do it in France, for example, that counterpose the, the idea of a, um, a republic to the idea of a colonial culture. And the fact that the republic has had since the beginning has been a colonial republic. And how do we deal with this and that we're still this is still a colonial republic that the minister of education was a minister of colonies in the 19th century like mr ferry like so all of these things need to be part of the same package and we need to be able to explain and discuss this um there is another thing that is of course very clear to us is that the trauma of colonization is not something that uh, can be repaired just with a few statements and we're really used here to the um, hypocrisy of administrations, be it the administration of our university at San Francisco State or governments, to just say a few words and think that then we can move on. Uh, and I do think that words are important. We are asking for words, but we're also asking for actions. So the question of the politics of reparations and what reparations means concretely uh, for those living today in the French uh, uh, state, but also those having suffered and been victims of colonization, those are very important discussions today. Uh, and, and, you know, there are also, again, in that domain, symbolic actions the French government is taking, like restoring, restituting a few artworks that were, like, uh, destroyed. I mean, the entire museum of the Louvre or the Quai Branly, which is a, a scandal that it exists, should be completely restored to, <laughs> right? So, but, so that is also, also a, a conundrum that we are, we have to deal with. And so teaching doing the research of lifting the voices of those who have been erased, but also creating a space where we can really analyze what is the nature, nature of this so-called republic and this so-called democracy and its inherent um, uh, intrication with colonial violence is very important. And, you know, for example, recently I, I, I watched the documentary by Raoul Peck, uh, Exterminate All the Brutes. And I do think that that should be, you know, that, that kind of like everybody should watch that in public school and discuss it before even discussing the great democracies and everything like that. We need to inherit this legacy and deal with it. So I'll stop there because I'm sure um, the other speakers here are going to have way more eloquent things to say, but I wanted to share how I envision the work we need to do, especially those who have the responsibility of teaching in a public institution like me. I don't want to be rude. I just want to say that, uh, yes, reparations are important. And since we're talking about France, Haiti had to pay France reparations for its freedom. And I'll just leave it there.
We can go up now Korea. to Ibrahim. Korea. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, uh, Jamila. I don't know, Korea wanted to say something because it was, uh, yes. if you want now or later. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, just a few words. I, I agree with uh, Felix when he says that uh, white people are always afraid. Each of us is a threat to them. And I understand completely the fact that fascism is a response to this fear. Absolutely. But in the same time, uh, we have to acknowledge that for the first time, this fear is based, is based on something true because they are declining. They are really declining. France is declining in Africa. The power of France is declining everywhere. And I think that fascism is also a response to, the, to this decline. I don't know if you heard about the French-African summit uh, here in, in, Mont in Montpellier last week. Sure. It was crazy. It was crazy because France is... Macron is completely conscious that uh, the French power is declining in, uh, in Africa because of China, because of Turkey, because of all other capitalist countries, okay? But uh, French ne Frenchness is not as powerful as before. And uh, I think that for the first time, this fear is based <laughs> on something true. But my my fear is that when they are declining it's it can be very dangerous for us much more dangerous for us and uh if you if you i don't know if you if you know about all the discourses that are occurring here in france uh, it's like in the 30s they are completely uh, uh free to say everything about Muslims, about, about black people, everything. Uh, the, the, the racist discourse is now, is now all, uh, every time in, in TV shows. So I think that this moment uh, is very dangerous, is very dangerous. And the, the problem is that uh, the left is so weak and it's not, the, the left is not only weak, the 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 left Excellent. is complicit <laughs> so uh, and uh, there is no there is no uh political movement decolonial political movement who is uh, strong enough to fight so in this context i think things are going to be um very mm. uh Dangerous, yes. Thank you, Hoyria. Ibrahim, can I invite you to add any comments for two or three minutes? Sure. Um, yeah, there's a lot to talk about. Resistance, praxis, you know, uh, narratives and, and all. I, 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 I'm aware that the, the video was a little bit long, but I just wanted to the part that was not uh, that was not uh, shown um what i wanted to say by by listing sort of the ways in which the colonial relationship uh continues between france and uh, and, and algeria in particular and and algeria and the global north, the global north. And, uh, in general is um, um that algerians are algerians aware of are the coloniality aware. of their situation uh, when you have an you mute, Huria. I'm so sorry to interrupt, Ibrahim. I think that's the feedback. Right. So you know the uh, uh, when Algerians on the 57th anniversary of the supposed uh, formal independence. This is in uh, uh, July 5th, 2019. You have millions of Algerians on the street chanting, "The people want independence." Shab yurid al-istiklal, or chants and slogans such as, "Is this a state?" Or a colonial administration, um, and may bring, bring in parallels with Palestine, for example. That's that uh, that pushes us to think that uh, you know uh, uh, that the praxis is 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 uh, really has the, the sort of the, this massacre of uh, sixty one. It needs 
it, it's not something that's of the past. It needs to, its power needs to be harnessed into the struggles that are going on today. Why is, is, we fall into, into sort of just uh, this memorialization. And uh, so it needs to be taken as a sedimented re repository of know-how, of values, of, uh, of political projects that, uh, that, that, uh, that need to, to, to inform our struggles today. By doing that, by listening to what the streets are saying, the slogans, and then we're centering those marginalized communities, that we are actually listening to them. We're taking their lead into what matters to them and to you know, their political analysis. So political analysis and theorizing doesn't happen in the academy. It doesn't happen with people you know, uh, holding PhDs. It actually happens on the streets of Algiers with, with the youngsters who, you know, who are ultras in football and soccer stadiums. You know, when you have those who, ha who haven't read all the theoretical texts, but they come out and tell you that the people want independence, they are theorizing. They are theorizing, and this is theorizing of the highest caliber. You know, saying that we, we, st we feel like we live under a colonial uh, administration. So, uh, and also the, the ways in which, uh, in which sort of the, uh, the uh, um, you know, the sort of the omnipresence of, of the Palestinian flag, for example, in these marshes, uh, uh, flags, you know, like the Chilean or the Haitian, Sudanese or, uh, and the Lebanese flags who have appeared uh, side by side with their, their Algerian counterpart, especially in, in protests that were um, held by the diaspora, the Algerians abroad, that shows you a consciousness that this is a global struggle against co colonial structures that have been put into, uh, into place over the last uh, four, at least 400 years. And uh, Algerians in the streets, uh, the, the, the Herak movement is saying that this is our contribution. This is our two cents to that, to that, uh, global, uh, to that global struggle. And uh, a statement also saying that we are aware that no one is free unless everyone is. So, you know, um, and also something that, to, uh, that I wanted to, uh, to add is uh, why I'm trying to make these linkages and I'm, uh, maybe I'm repeating myself with the Herak the, uh, nowadays and the movement in Algeria right now is that uh, there is a, a realization by Algerians in Algeria that you cannot demand from France, from colonialism, from imperialism. You cannot demand respect. You cannot demand recognition. You cannot demand uh, restitution of, of archives and, and, uh, and so on. You, can, you cannot demand uh, repatriation uh, or uh, reparation. What you, can, you should uh, impose them. So Algerians need to break the legs of colonialism in Algeria and create this space for 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 uh, for 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 both Algerians inside and outside of Algeria, as well as other racialized uh, racialized communities, that they can call home. Uh, that if 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 uh, the worst is coming, as Haria has just uh, pointed out, and I agree with uh, with, with that, uh, France is going down, and it wants to bring everyone else. You know, around it, down the world, the, it, and it's gonna do it in violence. It's gonna do it in in uh, in uh, in tyranny. Uh, and the most affected are racialized communities within within France. So Algerians are trying to decolonize Algeria, making it a space that can be called home by the wretched of the earth. Thank you, Ibrahim. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Yusuf to wrap us up before Dr. Rabab uh, closes the event. Toujours en français, hein? Ouais. Yonka, s'il te plaît. Oui, je suis d'accord avec euh, je suis d'accord avec tout ce qui a été dit. Euh, la France traverse et ce qu'a dit Ouria tout à l'heure aussi. La France traverse une, une période extrêmement difficile, 
euh, c'est difficile pour, euh, pour les Français, mais ça l'est encore davantage pour les Français, euh, euh, ce qu'on appelle les indigènes. Euh, ça l'est davantage parce que nous savons que, euh, que ce qui va se passer, euh, nous sommes au cœur de tout. Nous sommes au cœur de tout. Nous sommes, nous sommes l'objet même de la, de, de la campagne électorale. L'objet de la campagne électorale en France, il est, euh, ne porte même plus sur les politiques économiques, ne porte même plus sur, euh, sur les retraites, ne porte même plus sur des questions de lutte de classe porte essentiellement sur l'immigration et sur, et sur l'immigration musulmane et, et particulièrement algérienne parce que la guerre d'Algérie n'est pas terminée en France et on l'a su, on s'en rend compte tous les jours, nous avons grandi là-dedans, c'est-à-dire qu'après le fascisme, pendant la, après la Seconde Guerre mondiale, il y a eu ce qu'on appelle la dénazification, enfin même si cette dénazification a été superficielle il n'y a jamais eu de décolonisation enfin des, des, des mentalités, des esprits. Donc le, le prisme colonial est toujours, est toujours là, profondément. La guerre d'Algérie, l'indépendance de l'Algérie n'a jamais été acceptée dans ce pays et, et donc ce n'est pas étonnant que ce soit à nouveau les, 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 les Arabes, les musulmans, mais je le dis précisément les Algériens, qui soient la cible aujourd'hui des, des politiques les plus, les plus réactionnaires, les plus fascistes. Laisse euh, Bianca répondre. Oui, je vais laisser Bianca un petit peu dire un mot. Après, je terminerai si vous me permettez. Yeah. So uh, you said saying that he agrees with the remarks that having made that um, France today is going through a very difficult period uh, that is hard for French people, but specifically hard for uh, what we call the indigenous population, the indigène, um, who have been put at the center of the ongoing electoral campaign. Um, because we're not talking anymore about what are the best political policies to be implemented. We're not talking about uh, the retirement reform. Uh, we're not even talking about the class struggle and social issues. We're just talking about immigration and in particular, Muslim immigration, in particular, Algerian um, immigration in France. Um, and this is because uh, Youssef, as Youssef says, the Algerian war is not all over in, in France. It has never been over uh, after the period of collaboration of the French state with the Nazis. There was a clear period of denazification of society, a political process to break away from that. But the, the equivalent work has not been done after the colonial um, uh, period. On the opposite, there's been a resistance to do an equivalent decolonization of French society. So um, today, um, uh, Algerian population and Muslim and immigrants are at the center and they're becoming the targets. Uh, of a lot of these uh, violent attacks. Avec les musulmans, aujourd'hui, une nouvelle association musulmane vient d'être interdite en France. Euh, chaque jour, de nouvelles associations musulmanes sont interdites en France, sans aucun motif, sans aucune raison, et la classe politique française accepte cela sans aucun problème. Ce sont des associations musulmanes parfaitement légales euh, qui luttent contre le racisme, et euh, le Conseil d'État vous savez, le Conseil d'État, c'est une institution supérieure en France euh, qui décide si, euh, si une loi est conforme à la légalité. Et le Conseil d'État a validé, accepte ces, ces, ces interdictions sur le motif que ces associations euh, diffusent l'idée qu'il y a une islamophobie d'État en France. C'est-à-dire que dire qu'il y a une islamophobie d'État en France devient un motif de dissolution d'associations. On n'a jamais vu cela. Je crois que dans aucun même pays démocratique, entre guillemets, on ne voit cela. Aujourd'hui, il est possible de dissoudre une association qui dit simplement qu'il y a du racisme à l'État. Alors, voilà le niveau où on a atteint. Le plus grave, le plus grave surtout, c'est qu'aucun parti de gauche, entre guillemets, n'ose protester contre cela même. Aucun. Et, et bien sûr, le, pas, pas davantage le Parti communiste, même le parti de, de Mélenchon n'ose rien dire. Tout le monde est tétanisé. Donc, je dis que... Les, que les, les indigènes vont, doivent s'organiser aujourd'hui par eux-mêmes parce qu'ils ne peuvent compter sur personne d'autre. Et, et je crois que la lutte va être extrêmement difficile dans les années à venir en France, extrêmement difficile. Rien n'est à écarter, rien n'est à ignorer euh, comme, comme situation nouvelle qui va se produire. Ok. Um, so, not only Algerians, but the Muslims in general, the Muslim community is the target. And today, again, there was a new Muslim organization that was banned in France. That's become the routine in the past years and months. Every day, new Muslim organizations or existing Muslim organizations are banned. Um, they're considered illegal. 
uh, many of these organizations are perfectly legal organizations that just want to speak out and organize against existing racism in France. And what we're having is the State Council de Conseil d'État, which is an unelected official body that is validating uh, all of these uh, dissolutions of organizations. Because if as an organization you make the claim that the French state is carrying out Islamophobic policies, those are the grounds to be disbanded as an organization. Just, just to make that claim is already a ground to be disbanded and illegalized uh, in France. And that is actually never seen before in the history of, of France, but not in the France of the so-called uh, democracies, like it's unimaginable, that criteria to disband, illegalize uh, community organizations. So um, the worst uh, is that all no left-wing parties are speaking up against this. Uh, they're remaining silent. Even the Communist Party or the left front that is headed by Mélenchon is not speaking up against this violation, basic violation of law, um, because they're terrified. They're terrified of what is coming. So uh, Youssef is saying that uh, it seems like Muslims, uh, immigrants, racialized immigrants are left on their own to fight this. Uh, and it's going to be really hard times ahead. And we cannot rule out what will happen. But it seems like this is where things are heading. Haria, do you want to add anything at this moment? Thanks, Anka. Thanks very much, Anka. Yes, just to say that um, I'm very pessimistic, but in the same time, uh, we we saw uh, in the last few years that they, there was everywhere in the world, in the South, in particular, in particular, a lot of demonstrations. Uh, fighting liberalism, fighting imperialism, all over the world, in Africa, in the, the Arab world, in South America, uh, in Asia, uh, and in Algeria. Uh, uh, and I think that um, as decolonial, we are, uh, we have, uh, we think that in the North, uh, we are going to be liberated by the South. It means that we depend on the liberation of the struggles of the South. And we have to, 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 to fight all together. I could not agree more. Please, Felix, uh, we want to add anything at this moment? Hi, yes, I was just inspired by Brahim's talk. Um, it reminded me of a Haitian poet, Jacques Womet, who arrived in Paris to a very colonial metropolis. And he penned this stanza of a poem called a Saint-Neg, and excuse the French accent. Uh, this stanza goes, quand jusqu'au tam-tam aurons appris le langage de l'international, quand nous aurons choisi notre jour, le jour de Saint-Neg, de Saint-Indien, de Saint-Indou, de Saint-Indo-Chinois, de Saint-Arabe, de Saint-Malais, de Saint-Juif, de Saint-Poletérie, Et nous voici debout, tout le damné de la terre. And this is just a stressing of the need for unity across colonized and oppressed people in overthrowing the colonial regime. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you, Felix. Thank you, Jamila, and then Blanca, and then I will. Thank you. That brought a smile to all our faces, Felix. Thank you. Um, I would just say, you know, uh, again, uh, thinking of some of Yusuf's comments earlier about the curfew um, and, and linking it to what Blanca shared with us, uh, the curfew, uh, the language that was used in the decree of the curfew uh, in October 1961, right before the massacre, uh, was, uh, it was French Muslims from Algeria were banned from the street. It was Muslims. Uh, it was also that the massacre, that all the violence in Algeria was justified explicitly under the guise of fighting terrorism. There is no doubt that there's a million parallels uh, in terms of uh, US policy, in terms of also uh, you know, the entire war on terror. And uh, I'm not gonna suggest that it's exactly the same in France, uh, but uh, the question of, uh, of terrorism, fighting terrorism. We see it here even in Lebanon, where so much can be justified under the guise of fighting terrorism, uh, where you can have protesters shot in the street and it's okay because it's about fighting terrorism. It's about the scary Muslims. 
It's about reclaiming Lebanon, this old French colony. I know I brought Lebanon in very last minute, which is a tough one, but I'll just say, you know, it's about uh, the, the French colony, Lebanon. Oh, we want to go back to that. That was great. And of course, it's all about fascism, of course. Uh, that was a bit of a general statement, but I'll end here. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm just going to say a couple of things as, uh, as my, in my role as participant, not only a moderator, co-moderator. Uh, I wanted to say a couple of things. I mean, I agree with a lot of the stuff that's been said. Before actually we wrap up, I wanted to also point out to a campaign. I spoke about prisoners, so I want to point out to the campaign to free George Abdullah, which is ongoing now. So people sign up, uh, register, and, uh, and be sure. And this is one sign of the fascism of the French state. And I will, won't continue with that. The second point I wanted to say is that, uh, just to underline, and I know we agree with that, that we are making differences between whiteness and white people, so we're talking about a perspective. But I also was thinking about a couple of issues that what uh, Brahim, you said about the whole question of what's going on in Algeria and the colonial legacies, and you likened it to Palestine, and the, the question of actually recruiting native informants, which you spoke about, Yusuf, but you could not, did not have a chance to continue talking about that. So there is also, they're constantly recruiting people from our own ranks to sort of like stamp and give rubber stamp to whatever is them. And then they present them, they say, here are the people, your own people are saying so and so and so. And we know this is not the case because they really don't represent the will or legitimate concerns and, or the histories of the people. But again and again and again, it continues. We see it here in the US, we see it here, we see it in France and so on. We see it definitely in the persecution and repression of uh, uh, people who are protesting throughout and continue to protest throughout. Yeah, and then, which is completely, completely unacceptable and the fact that it is it's a problem. Uh, another point, but also about the left, I was on a panel last week at the American Studies Association, which was about the US left and the world. And one of the questions that I was thinking about, because I started talking about the left and I talked about the US left, US Communist Party, USA, and other leftist groups and so on. And then I stopped myself, even I was presenting, and I presented my presentation and critique of my presentation that when we think of the left, we actually accept the definition of a conventional left, that the left is the only white European left. And everybody else who actually has leftist perspectives, and if you talk about the US, you talk about the American Indian movement, the Black Panther Party, the Young Lords, the Iroquois Party. I mean, there is a whole bunch. The left, the left that is supposed to be extremist left or marginalized, like completely, completely goes out the window. And we only, actually, we accept the definition of the status quo and the hegemonic uh, definition of what the left is. And I think that also in our own thinking, we need to shift that. We need to shift that. We need to challenge it. Because what is the left is sort of like one thing that it is acceptable, but also what do we need to think about that? The final, the, 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 uh, one point about the solidarity with Palestine and so on, it's always all over. And actually, I just want to say that this is this is how I got to know uh, Horia and uh, Yusuf. I mean, there were so many events throughout. I can't remember how many every single time around Palestine. So on the same with, the, with the, you know, with Blanca, um, Felix uh, partner actually was one of our colleagues on the Teaching Palestine, Mamira Prosper, who has been amazing and actually gave a presentation about Haiti and Palestine in Palestine and also arranged for us to go to the Caribbean Studies Association conference in Havana, Cuba. So, I mean, there is kind of like so many linkages. Why I'm saying all of this stuff? I'm saying it because I have my students coming, joining us in three classes, Edward Said, uh, gender and modernity in Arab and Muslim communities, and comparative border studies, Palestine and Mexico. And each set of classes actually has specific questions to ask about what does this mean? Why is this really important? What are the issues? I don't want to, and the, my students are, and our stu my students, our students, our youth, all of us are smart enough to understand what's going on. So we really don't ever want to dumb it down and we don't want to give sort of like very, very flattening analysis. We want to actually say, how do we understand this? This is why we're raising difficult questions. And we're raising questions that don't necessarily get raised in the classroom. When, why would we want to say that? Because we want to think about this an ongoing project. This is an ongoing project, teaching Palestine, open classroom, an ongoing project. So my last words to all of you is that we really would like you to come back. We would like to be able to have more conversations. This is just the beginning. The unfortunate reality is we are mourning and commemorating a massacre that was hidden from history by the powers that be. 
And it's our job to challenge the erasure and to actually make closed narratives open and public for everybody. So as we do that, can we think about actually even bringing all our classrooms together, not just one event, in order for us to try to create a different future, to challenge the colonial archives, to challenge the colonial master narratives, and not only challenges in knowledge production, but also challenges in terms of changing the world. And I want to thank you all for being such amazing, um, and I'm really sorry about disappearing from the beginning, but thank you so much. We love you. You make us, you make it possible. And thank you all for volunteering to bring yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The so fire continue. Thank you, everyone.